Attorney General, 20, let's see, 26th Attorney General of the state of Arizona, Mark Burnovich, is my guest this week on Newsmaker Saturday. Attorney General, this is your exit interview. Oh, yes, it is. It is. I'm glad I could <laughs> stay with you, John. It's good uh, to see always you. one of my favorite people, and so my mom says hello. <laughs> Thank her. I appreciate that. You grew up here, yeah. went to school here. Um, you look back on this eight years. Give me the highlight and then give me the toughest point. Uh, on a macro level, I, I am so blessed. As you know, I never ran for office before I ran for attorney general. And when I was arguing Brnovich v. DNC, um, you know, two years ago, case involving election integrity, the most important election case in a generation, I remember standing up before the court thinking, what an amazing country where you can go from one generation being a first-generation American, a public school kid, Shadow Mountain High right. School, ASU, to arguing against the president of the United States, or excuse me, the Democratic Party. I've argued against Joe Biden as well, but arguing at the U.S. Supreme Court in a case literally named after you. I was like, what an amazing opportunity. And that by far was the highlight. Your dad was from Montenegro. Correct. Your mom from? Croatia. Croatia. The best of all worlds. <laughs> That's a beautiful part of the world. It absolutely is. Incredibly stunning part of the world. So you end up interning as a freshman for John McCain. Yes. Is that correct? That is correct. How did you get that gig? When I was a freshman, I didn't even know my way to class at ASU. Well, it's funny, and maybe this is a sign of the times. I had a friend when I was debating in high school um, who had, was going to work for Dennis DeConcini, as an intern for Dennis DeConcini, and he was telling me about it, and I was like, really, you can do internships? And he was one, oh, yeah, you should find it some Republican, you know, and do it. And that's how I ended up. And John McCain was just in Congress. He had just recently been elected. And so it was, it was an amazing opportunity. So in essence, you're running for his seat in this last election. <laughs> yes, I, yes. Again, another American story where you have to kind of say, what in the world? I, I remember, John, there was times when I was running. And as you know, Barry Goldwater is one of my heroes. And I, I would sit there and almost say to myself, it is crazy to think I may be sitting at the same desk as Barry Goldwater and John McCain. Um, obviously, it didn't work out, but just the fact that I was in that race and I had that opportunity is just an amazing. What's the most important thing you learned from John McCain? Um, always be a straight shooter and never wear a tie outside of Maricopa County. <laughs> Those are the, I remember I, the first time I went on a trip with him, we were going to Graham County, and I'm like, you know, an 18-year-old, and I'm like, oh, like nervous. Wow. And I show up in like a jacket and a tie, and everyone's got like jeans on and a button down, and he's like, once we're outside of Maricopa County, no ties. And no, so that, that is a lesson that has stayed with that me my, my entire life. Okay, um, for better or for worse, your eight years has most recently been defined by the elections of 2020, even 2022 now. Um, can you please clear the air on the election? Let, let me start with a basic question. Did Joe Biden win the 2020 election? Yes. No, I, I, no I've doubt said that. I've, I've said that, and I, um, I don't think that there's any dispute on that. Did he win it? Fair and square. I think that the, the Democrats and Joe Biden used every tool available in their toolbox to win that election. And part of my great frustration, John, is when I was even running for the Senate, is people would be, including President Trump, would be out there saying, there was whatever, 35,000 votes injected, dead people voted. And it was like the boy who cried wolf. That was all demonstrably false. And so now you hear people say, oh, well, maybe Twitter did this or they suppressed the story. Look, the bottom line is, is that Joe Biden won, they out-hustled, they outworked the Republicans, and even this last election cycle, I mean, my goodness, you have Republicans criticizing mail-in voting, and 20, 30 years ago, Republicans were great at that. And John McCain. And, John and that's McCain. how they won seniors, they won the military yeah. vote, and so... It John was, McCain was a big proponent of this in Arizona. Absolutely. And owned the early vote. Absolutely. So uh, Joe Biden was a legitimate winner. Um, there was things the Republicans could have and should have done better, but my goodness, the mistake every general makes, whether you're an attorney general or military general, is fighting the last war. What Republicans should be doing right now is focusing on what can we do to get our message out? Because the reality is, is that this last election cycle, and I know you, you know these things, you've been around, you talk to anybody, Republican or Democrat, this should have been a wave election. It should have been an historic election. Uncontrolled border, record inflation, all the anxiety. So what about, happened? Um, candidates matter. You know, I remind folks, I got more votes than Cinnamon McSally. Candidates matter or fealty to Donald Trump killed the candidates? Uh, well, everyone that Donald Trump endorsed um, won the primary. And so I think you ended up with a lot of candidates that couldn't run general election campaigns. You know, I, I got more votes than Cinnamon McSally, even though I got outspent by millions. I, I was viciously attacked 
the last month of the election. So it's about more than just money or, um, you know, in these election cycles, candidates matter. And I had a real record of, you know, the stuff we did as AG. But unfortunately, as one of my, um, you know, friends told me, who's, you know, prominent business person in town, you were the absolutely right guy at the absolute worst time. So in other words, with you certifying the election and being part of that, that was a death knell for Donald Trump. He then endorses Blake Masters. We, yes, just technically, legally, I witnessed the certification, but okay. yes, I was part of that process. Okay, yes. so yes. when that happens, do you know at that point when he doesn't endorse you, it's game over in a primary? Look, it was tough. I, as you know, I did not run for anything before I ran for AG. I was the underdog. Remember, I took on an incumbent in my own party. I've always been the underdog. I've been the underdog, underdog my whole life. I'm a public school kid with a funny last name that people still can't pronounce. So, I mean, I... I, I went in saying, look, I, I, I put my trust in Arizona voters, and I said, look, I have a real record. You give me an issue, John, border. I filed the first... We're going to get there. I mean, the first, first lawsuit in the entire country over the unconstitutional COVID vaccine. I sued Secretary Yellen over, you know, uh, laws and statutes that said the states can't cut income taxes. I've been a proponent of federalism and private property rights back when Donald Trump was writing checks for Hillary Clinton. So, I mean, I had a real record, and I maybe was naive to think, I will go in and explain to people that I'm a real Arizonan, I understand the issues, I have a real record. Why put your faith in someone else just because the former president endorsed him? Back to the election for a minute. Um, you're on this John Stewart interview show, the John Stewart deal. Yeah. And I'm watching this, and he is pressing you over and over again to call the election denial a bunch of nonsense. And you really struggled to say it in that interview. Why? I don't think I struggled. I would disagree with that characterization. What the way he was asking those questions and that the way that whole dialogue started was one of those things that, unlike you, he wouldn't even let me finish my answers. And so I was trying to explain to him my position, and he wanted a simple yes or no answer. As I said on 60 Minutes, look, I mean, there, there's a bunch of people, a bunch of grifters out there that are making a lot of money off claiming the 2020 election was stolen. Name names. Um, I, I don't want to. Uh, all these people are very litigious, John, and I don't want to end up in another lawsuit. But, but I will say this, look, there are groups, and people can go to our website, that we have begged for information, for facts and evidence, and they continually didn't turn them over, and then now they say they did and we lost. It, it's, it's so patently ridiculous. I can't prove a negative. What I can tell you is, is look, I prosecuted the first cases in Arizona history on ballot harvesting. I went to the U.S. Supreme Court and personally argued Brnovich v. DNC. We, did, we stopped a lot of the nonsense in 2020 that happened in other states. So, I mean, I have a real record on these issues, but as a prosecutor, we still get complaints. We're getting, we still have information and complaints related to the 2020 election cycle. And so we're going through this and no prosecutor worth their salt is going to issue a blanket statement saying this was all great or there was absolutely no fraud because you don't know what's going to pop up and you don't want some judge or defense attorney being able to say, well, Brnovich said this on this date. Therefore, he can't process. So you have to stay a little bit above the phrase, what you're telling me, as the attorney general. And I've you done that can't consistently. go too far one way or the other because you're in the middle of it. I've done it consistently, John. And I've said, when we wrap up, when we include, for example, when we wrapped up and included the portion that said these allegations, the cyber ninjas said that all these dead people voted and that was repeated by the former president, we went through and systematically spent hundreds yes. of hours and we disproved it. And so when we got to the point where we could say, we only found one instance. We were able to publicly say, we're concluded this part of the investigation. There was one, only one instance of, of a dead person. Voting. Okay, on 2022, the printers in Maricopa County. What's your involvement in that whole thing? Um, well, once again, the Secretary of State, County Recorder, the County Supervisors run the elections. But uh, I will just tell you, as an Arizonan, um, it's so unacceptable that you have what thir up to 30 percent of 30 percent yeah it's really unacceptable and this is one of the points Do you think that may have changed the election outcome uh, john i think it, it, look i'm a prosecutor lawyer i think that's it's speculative right and there's ongoing litigation right now trying to address those issues but let me just put this even in the context of 2020 in 2020 when we pointed out that there was ballots that didn't have a proper chain of custody you know the newspaper and the county supervisors went on the attack and the offensive and criticized me and you know whatever was very were critical of me and i kept saying but they're not addressing the under, the fund the fundamental or underlying problem and in this day and age whether it's 2022 in printers or 2020 with um chain of custody 
things need to be buttoned up. I mean, whether it's your power grid or whether it's your bank account, whether it's your personal cell phone. And so just because I would point out that there was deficiencies, I would get attacked. And the reality is even now, I mean, I cannot believe that more people in the media aren't critical of the fact that this is not a third world country. How do you end up with that kind of failure rate, regardless, you know, as you think down you the road? Think you, do you think it could have been intentional? This is what the people are alleging. Look, I, I learned a long time ago as a prosecutor that a lot of times people do dumb and incompetent things. I mean, so I would be, I mean, I've seen no evidence of that. Let me put it that way. Okay. I mean, it, it, is it conceivable or possible that someone had an agenda and purposely made sure these machines didn't have? I, I find that hard to believe. Again, I've seen evidence of it. But would you not be disenfranchising? That's the word that's been used. Republicans and Democrats in these precincts. Well, generally speaking, and this is before, let's say, before the 2020 election cycle, there there was issues related to whether it's mail-in voting or this this method or that method, and there was a general understanding that once sometimes you'd have incompetent election officials, and that would lead to. You know, long lines. If you remember the former, I was very critical of the former Secretary of State. Right. And, you know, uh, and if you remember even the former county recorder ended yes, up being voted on off. And, and, and she was a very decent, honorable person, but people blamed her for the long lines of what happened. And so sometimes there's just whatever reason things Stuff don't work happens. out, but it ends up generally kind of affecting both sides equally. And so, you know, I, I've not seen... Do you think, as a lawyer, any of this stuff will bear fruit? Election, uh, Carrie Lakes, uh, Abe Hamaday's challenging I, the election? I don't know because I'm not involved in the litigation, but I will say that um, Abe's, Hamaday's, his election is, what, like 500 votes yes. or something? And, you know, there was issues regarding the curing periods. I don't know, um, you know, historically... Courts are very reluctant to overturn or change election, election results. The will of the people. Um, it has happened. I mean, you know, but, I mean, it's such a rare, rare occurrence. So, I mean, unless there's usually, unless there's evidence of overwhelming fraud, let's say someone intentionally did something with printers and machines, um, courts generally won't overturn. Is there a difference between incon an inconvenienced voter and a disenfranchised voter? Yes, absolutely. There's a difference between having to wait an extra hour in line, and not being able to vote at all. And, and that's the reality, is that... Do um, you think that's what the courts will look at in the end? I well, one, once again, there's some legal issues, apparently, with some ballots that may or may not have been cured or should or shouldn't have been counted. So putting aside those issues, but as to just the printer issues, I, I'm speculating, but I think that's really, really tough to win a case like that because, you know, the theory is it affects both sides or all sides the same, and it stinks. It's incompetence, and people shouldn't have to wait an extra hour or two hours, um, but they still have that ability to vote. And one of the lessons, John, one of the lessons of this, I think, goes back to what we were just talking about. Republicans, I don't know why Republicans started demonizing early voting, mail-in voting. I think it, it stems used, from Donald Trump, and, and that, frankly. And, and so instead of maybe waiting the last minute, Republicans need to do a better job of getting out the vote and making sure people vote and get their ballot in as soon as possible. Yeah, or you're playing um, you're playing 21 points down going into the fourth quarter and trying to play catch up. Yeah. And yeah. probably not a great formula for Republicans. We're going to take a break. When we come back, immigration, huge issue for you. Uh, we're back with Attorney General Mark Burnovich on his exit interview. Back in a moment. Back on Newsmakers Saturday with outgoing Attorney General Mark Burnovich. Why did you choose to run for U.S. Senate and not governor? I know it pays better. But... <laughs> well, quite frankly, John, the issues I'm passionate about, you know, foreign policy, what's going on in the world, you know, federalism, securing our border, those were all issues that I thought that I would have a better opportunity to protect Arizona and, you know, serve our state in the Senate versus, you know, being the governor. And the reality is I never planned on running for anything. When I ran for AG, I, like, I don't like politics. I don't like the way... You do know, you like it now? No. I hate it even worse, I think. My goodness, all you do is look around. I mean, it's crazy. Let me... I'll give you a quick anecdote how, like, bad the political situation is. Is the party chair, when our office was in court, um, stopping Joe Biden from rescinding Title 42 this spring... Was still We're going to talk about this. We won. Our office was in court doing that, 
And you know what? County, the state party wouldn't even say my name, wouldn't even mention the fact that we were involved because of politics. And so um, I think there's a lot of people with their own personal agendas that really don't care about protecting Is us. Donald Trump bad for the Republican brand in your view now? Look, people can make their own conclusions about Donald Trump. The, the, the interesting thing about, you know, President Trump is, I mean, I've talked to him. In fact, uh, he called me just a couple weeks ago. And uh, what I told him was, I said, Mr. President, my mom is so disappointed you didn't endorse me in the primary. He's like, well, you know, it's uh, nothing personal, you know. And so um, it's, uh, he is an interesting guy. He got the more votes than any Republican, obviously, in, in our country's history. And so he's still relevant. But what I think, what I think is, is that, look, if, if we are serious, if we are serious about issues, we're serious about federalism, you know, we're serious. We've got, in states like Arizona, states like Georgia, you've got to be able to win over moderates, independents, and Republican women. And, you know, right now, I think, I would hope that we have a Republican leader that helps bring people together, that we focus on the issues. I was saying earlier, this should have been a wave election, and this, it wasn't. This Why is wasn't Ronald Trump? Reagan's um, quote about, and I'll just paraphrase, it's better to get half of what you want than go flying off the cliff, marching off the cliff with your flag up, and just disappear into the abyss. I, I will do you one better. I, Ronald Reagan used to say, if someone agrees with you seven out of, or eight, out of 10 times, they're not your enemy, they're your friend. And I used to always say, the Brnovich caveat to that is if someone agrees at 10 out of 10 times, you know, it ain't your wife, it ain't your kids, it's like someone you're paying, like a psychiatrist. <laughs> I mean, because no one agrees with anyone all the times. And that's the thing is that we have these ideological purity tests. And look, the same thing's happening with the Democrats now. You see Kristen Sinema's becoming independent. Right. We are getting to this point. Would you run for that race? No, 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 no. I, look, it, it is, I mean, my goodness, did you not see what happened in the last primary? No, I did. I mean, but I mean, in a three-way race, what do you... Oh, you... I, I think there's going to be people salivating to run in that race because other political people have made that calculation. You are not going to do it? Oh, I, my kids... Do yeah. you think you're out of politics at this point? Oh, I would never say never. We talk about bands. I know that you always have an encore. I've seen the Stones a bunch of times. They always come out and sing one song, Satisfaction, or Jumpin' Jack Flash, or um, Street Fighting Man, and then... You know, you've got uh, the Grateful Dead sometimes. I just saw Bob Weir a couple weeks ago here in Arizona, and he came out and did a 20-minute version of Werewolves of London. So you don't know what's going to happen. There's always an encore. I don't know what that is. I mean, I, I look, I, I love policy. As you know, um, I was a federal prosecutor, state prosecutor, worked at Goldwater. I love policy. I want to make the state better, and I'm trying to figure out where and I And you in. really thought that that was in the U.S. Senate, not as governor, as the CEO of the state? I think I would have had an opportunity... You know, quite frankly, I've, I've had a national profile. I've been on Fox a lot. I've got the endorsements of Sean Hannity, Mark Levin. And I thought I would have an opportunity to help bend even other Republicans in a direction where we got back to federalism and making sure we're protecting people and securing our... Let's talk about immigration. Title 42. Uh, still, there's some limbo because a federal judge has gotten involved again. Um, we are playing a semantic game here. Is this what we're seeing illegal? These are people coming over now claiming asylum, but most of the claims, I think 85%, are really economic. Very few end up in true asylum claims. People are coming here for economic reasons. You can't blame them. You fully understand why they do it. But this, to me, I think when you watch these images, it makes no sense to anyone. Agree 100%. I was just talking to one of my Democratic counterparts, and I said, if you really believe in long-term immigration reform, what is happening now is completely undermining it. I mean, you know, you show those images, look, more than 5 million people since Joe Biden has become president have illegally entered the country. That's like the population of, you know, the entire state of Louisiana or the population of, you know, Vermont and Wyoming and Alaska combined. So you're seeing a record amount of people coming it's over. bigger than Maricopa County. We're, we're seeing a record amount of people. We're seeing cities like Yuma, you know, with millions and millions of dollars of healthcare costs they're having to absorb. We know that there are an average of 2,000 gotaways a day. So, so not only do you have these people coming over that, you know, for economic reasons, but now you're seeing 2,000 gotaways. These are people dressed in camouflage. And Why mirrors. would anybody in power want to let this happen? I think the Democrats assumed erroneously that somehow this would endear them to a lot of uh, immigrants or you know, other groups. And, and the reality, even based on my own experience, you know, I don't do polling, but I, you know, I talk to my mom and her friends from church, and they're offended by this. 
because you know they think they had to go through a process and no one gave, they had to work two and three jobs no one gave them tickets to go see their cousins or put them up at a hotel at Scottsdale and Shea I mean, I remember when I was back at Goldwater, the Goldwater Institute, I had an intern who was working on her third degree. She came from a wealthy family in Mexico because she couldn't get a green card. And so I think there are a lot of immigrants right now that think this is fundamentally unfair and that I think it actually makes it harder to do any sort of, you know, changes in the future. Do you believe it's, it's as bare knuckle as they, they think that these are future voters? Or think, is this a, we have a shrinking birth rate in this country? Is it to get workers, young workers here? Is there another reason? I've asked everybody on this show, why is this happening? I, I, I think it is a cold political calculation by Joe Biden and people, the Democrats in his administration. And I will tell you, John, I have said this, you know, and I've said it earlier. I, look, I'm a first-generation American. I know why people want to come here. When we have people not wanting to come here, it is a problem. But you cannot have chaos. The rule of law, the very reason why people are fleeing these countries where you have, you know, oppressive economic conditions, sometimes dictators and, you know, single party rule is because the rule of law means nothing. Yep. And, and so we have to make sure that when people are coming here, it's done in an orderly and lawful fashion. We got two minutes. I have to ask you, we're going to we're going to show what we halted executions in this state in 2014 after a badly botched execution. Now we are starting to get this rolling again and we'll show the the uh, this is obviously lethal injection. You're comfortable with this? This is something we should be doing. I've been to executions, and as you know, I started my career as a game I have prosecutor, as well. and we have to do everything we can to protect the most vulnerable, and this is one way that society does that, that those who commit the ultimate crimes get the ultimate punishment. Okay, I'm going to show you video of the gas chamber. I think I've asked you this before offline. I'm going to ask you on the air. Why can we not come up with a way, if we're going to do this, to bleed oxygen out of the gas chamber, fill it with nitrogen, it would be like hypoxia on an airliner that lost pressurization. Everybody goes to sleep. You don't have to get drugs, a cocktail of drugs. Just deprive them of oxygen. They fall asleep and die. Why are we not doing it that way? And maybe we should. In fact, maybe we should go back to firing squads. I mean, at the ultimate, ultimately, though, the people that are opponents of the death penalty make it costly, make it difficult to execute people, and then they complain about why it takes so long, or why we can't get these drugs. I mean, it is crazy to think that we focus so much on whether some defendant, some degenerate killer, and I know you were down in Tucson when people like, you know, um, Debbie James Carlson. Dean, James Dean Clark. I wouldn't uh, say that. And, 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 and kill four people. And, and these are degenerate killers, and they are getting the punishment they deserve. And instead of focusing on the victims and the victim's family and closure, we're sitting here debating about how do we get the drugs or what are the methods are. I am very proud of the fact, John, that since I've been AG, we have resumed executions, and three degenerate killers, um, you know, including pedophiles, have been executed, and there's another death warrant we just asked for. Proudest, proudest of, of what achievements says your eight years in office? What are the proudest achievements? Well, my proudest achievement is being a, a, a great dad and having two amazing, wonderful do daughters that um, you know, are well-adjusted, very caring, and straight-A students. But I think as AG, when I came in, as you remember, there was a lot of controversy over the office, and there were scandals, and I'm very proud of the fact that we restored the mission of that office, which is to do, to do justice. As Attorney General, I tell all of our agents, lawyers, prosecutors, legal assistants, at the end of the day, you don't count success in terms of how many years of prison, like how much money you've saved the state, has justice been done, is ultimately what has happened. And if you look at whether it's record amount of consumer restitution, you know, taking on, you know, companies, providing protection to victims here, working with the legislature, we have made sure that justice is done, and I was the people's lawyer. I'm very proud of that. Mark Burnovich, best of luck. Thanks, John. It's good to see you. Mark Burnovich, we're back in a minute on Newsmakers Saturday.